Now, we have been talking for a couple of weeks, we've spoken to a couple of different people about the whole idea of, uh, of how we're going to generate our electricity into the future. It's a, it's a big debate right now where we, uh, where we integrate renewables, what's the role of gas, what's the role of coal, and whether we're going to have a conversation about nuclear power. Now, nuclear is a long-term thing, but... Uh, I have been wanting for a couple of weeks now to speak to Ted O'Brien. Now, he's the Shadow Minister for Climate Change and Energy. He did uh, chair a very big inquiry into nuclear power and the future of nuclear power. There was a whole range of reports. I've told you a few times, you can just go and have a look at the record. A lot of people gave evidence. There was a lot of really good information in there. So we have had a conversation. There's a lot of a lot of resources that you can go to and have a look at. So I'll be wanting to have a chat to him about this and see where we are with nuclear, remembering it's not the answer to where we are today. So let's bring him in, Ted O'Brien, who's the uh, member for Fairfax, Shadow Minister for Climate Change and Energy. Mr O'Brien, good evening to you. How are you going, John? Not too bad. Before we get to nuclear, which is a long-term thing, we do have this present situation. It's cold. We've got the uh, the market under a lot of pressure, and it is now being recalibrated. So this people are hearing terms they've never heard before, the capacity mechanism and how we put all of these different forms of energy into the market to keep the power coming out of the wall. How do you explain where we are today? Well, uh, people in a lot of pain is a short of it. Um, over the last few weeks alone, people's power prices, uh, they've gone up. Businesses are hurting, um, households are really struggling at the moment. And so I think everybody is deeply concerned. I know I am. Um, and the latest news is this capacity mechanism, which is something that we designed in government as a coalition. Um, unfortunately, the only thing that's changed in the whole energy world over the last few months has been a change of government. Um, you know, the, the, the pressures from um, Ukraine, from ageing coal plants, um, inflation and so forth, all of those existed this time last month as we went to an election. Um, the only thing that's changed is government, and unfortunately, I think the wheels are coming off, and already we are seeing both Anthony Albanese and his minister, Chris Bowen, absolutely clueless on how to manage the problem. No one's blaming them for causing an energy crisis, which is a global thing, just as people can't blame the coalition. But how it is managed within Australia is the responsibility of whoever is in office, and right now, that is now the, uh, the Labor government. Um, the operator, uh, known as AEMO, is their acronym. They have had to step in on the East Coast and take over the entire market to determine um, the, the supply, the allocation. Unheard of. That has never been done across the entire NEM before because um, the wheels are coming off. Yeah, but they've and, done it, haven't they? Because we've well, essentially there were there were there were plants sitting there that weren't prepared to put their energy into the system. Is that right? I think that's part of the explanation. But um, here's what we were doing only a month ago. We had the then energy minister Angus Taylor and the then resource minister Keith Pitt um, continuously on the phone negotiating and pressuring the gas companies to keep pouring supply into the system so that reliability could be there and, of course, prices can be kept down. Um, that, that's how we got, you know, power bills came down 8% for households the last two years. Yep. It went down 8%, right? So we were managing this by putting industry at the centre. What we have now is a Labor Party and they do what they do. It's big government stuff. Yep. They are putting government at the centre and that's why uh, we've got the problems we have yep. today. In fairness, the price rises were going to happen anyway, weren't they? They, they, were, they were slated, uh, they were supposed to be announced in early May. It was put off, but they were going to come anyway, the price rises, weren't they? It, 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 it's all about magnitude, right? And, and, and the thing what um, was not expected were the prices absolutely skyrocketing um, that led to the intervention that was required because there was a shortage of supply. Okay. Um, yep. And that, that, that's the problem there. But anyway, this has got a long way to go. Uh, we just have to remember one thing, though, John. The Labor Party won office last month. Their promise, when all these problems were still there, their promise was to reduce everyone's power bills at home by $275. 
that's their commitment. It's the measure they've put yep. in place, and that's how they'll be held to account. No, I, I don't look. I, I, I thought that was by 2030. Was that right? When everything 2025. Oh, 2025. Okay, Indeed. All right, 2025. Okay. Well, let's let's mark that one then. 2025. <laughs> just but but just to explain to people the capacity mechanism, because there's a lot of our listeners listening to us who have they have solar panels on their roofs, so they're generating their own power, which is fantastic. It's uh, it's progress, and some of them are putting their power back into the system. You've got large scale solar farms. You got you've got uh, wind farms and the like so when they're operating the uh, the, the big generators particularly coal-fired power stations well they can't sell their their stuff into the market because it's already being done but then of course when the clouds come over and the wind stops blowing their stuff is required so that's what this capacity mechanism is about finding a way to integrate the uh, the existing systems with the new systems yeah that, that that's just it john so um the idea is we've got all of these renewables coming into the system right now. And that means there has to be this service off to the side so that uh, in the event of the sun not shining, the wind not blowing, you can draw down hmm. on, um, on other generators' supply. Now, um, last week, Chris Bowen had made it very clear that his instruction to the, the group that looked at this, which is the Energy Security Board, was this new mechanism, this sort of um, service of extra capacity sitting out there, should come from renewables and storage. Thankfully, the Energy Security Board said no today. They said that's wrong. Um, it must include the likes of gas and coal. Unless you use what's readily available, you are going to have more blackouts and higher prices. And this is where, again, I think um, the, the, uh, the wheels are coming off somewhat with, uh, with the yep. new government. But let, let's wait and see. A long way yep. to go yet. I mean, they are talking about gas and they're talking about Narrabri and, and, and that as a... Because gas, gas, is, gas is the most efficient, isn't it, in terms of being able to ter be turned off and turned on quite quickly compared to, say, coal-fired or even nuclear that we're going to talk about where they've got to operate all the time. Is that correct? Yeah, so look, uh, right now, uh, I think that the simplest way of putting it is as we are under a transition, there is nothing more important than gas. Um, you start turning gas off in this country, yep. then um, it will go from bad to worse. Gas is our friend. Gas is the friend of renewables. Um, and if we want a fair income transition where people do not have their prices skyrocket and we do not have blackouts, we need gas. Yep. All right. Well, let, let's move to nuclear then because you conducted that inquiry and I've been very keen to stress it's not a, a short-term solution. We can't whack one up, you know, very, very quickly. And the issue yeah, is whether right. large-scale nuclear is economical anymore. So if we could put it, I, I guess there's two questions. The whole large-scale nuclear plant, are they still an economical proposition for a country like Australia? And then the question of these smaller modular plants that we keep hearing about. So you conducted an inquiry, you took a lot of evidence. So what's your overview of where we are with nuclear today and what kind of plants we could be looking at? John, our position has always been that we need to have an open conversation mm. about this. And when it comes to technologies, uh, the trick is to have a balance, not to put all of your bet on one type of technology. Yep. We need a balance, right? Now, um, in other parts of the world, people are leaning more and more into nuclear. And that includes the United States, it includes France, it includes the UK. They're, they're building more and more nuclear, and that is because it is a proven technology, a zero carbon emissions technology um, that can be run on industrial scale. Extraordinary stuff. Um, when we did an inquiry a few years ago, the conclusion that we reached was Australia should not consider the old technology, uh, especially the old sort of Soviet era mm. technology. Mm. We, we, we shouldn't touch it with a barge pole, keep away from it. Mm. However, it's the new and emerging technologies which we should seriously consider. And, and that's where we should have a conversation. And they are these small yep. modular reactors. And so if you think of a, uh, how it used to be done, um, the large um, construction site mm. for a nuclear plant, um, you need a very bespoke system. You need to turn up to the site, enormous amount of construction work. The capital costs were huge. It would go over enormous amount of time, and therefore the financing would cost more, et cetera, et cetera. These small modular reactors turns that business model on its head. Now you're looking at the possibility of having small reactors in a modulated form mm. come off the factory shelf. 
So done basically within a factory. Um, from there, they get distributed to where they are needed. And so you can imagine what that does to everything from not just the size of these things, because, you know, they can be as small as, let's say, um, 77 megawatts, um, but also the, um, the, the costings of it. I mean, no longer are you looking at an enormous capital outlay up front with a high degree of uncertainty. Um, you, you are effectively buying something that has economies of scale built in to yep. the manufacturing run. All right. This is what I'm interested in because I know having looked at some of the reports that you produced when you when you chaired this inquiry back in 2019, even the likes of Ziggy Swiskowski, who's been a champion for nuclear power, said, look, the idea of these large plants has passed us by. We need to look at these smaller modular ones. So am I correct with this that you can say have a very small one go to power a small part of a regional area or you might put two of them together? You, you, the size can depend on how many you put together? Yeah, that, that's exactly right. I mean, if you think of them, this is probably a crude, simplistic way to put mm. it, but if you think of them as large containers, right, um, and you can you, you effectively build it like you would Lego pieces. Um, you, you, you put them together as you want to build a larger, um, a larger facility mm. or you reduce them. Um, and so let's say, you know, your example there, if you wanted to um, put, um, let's say, two of these um, new scale 77 megawatts together, you know, you're, you're probably talking about um, looking after well over half a million average Australian households from two small modular mm. reactors. Mm. Um, but you can you can put as many as let's say twelve together, yep. um, or you can just have one, um, and that's how it works. Which also takes a bit of pressure away. You can imagine if you're making a decision on the old technology, you have to make a big call as to how big these things have to be. Sure. But on the smaller ones, you can basically um, grow the um, the number of modules on an as needed basis which also means you can take away the pressure on your upfront capital, mm. and that makes it far more economical. Okay. Are these things, because I, I, I read about these things, that there's maybe one or two of them operating, they're still very much in the development stage, but as we know with these things, it can happen very quickly. Yeah, indeed. Um, they're, they're in development. There's about 50 different small modular reactors in development at the moment, believe it or not, a huge number. Um, and, uh, and the US is the one I referred to before with yeah. their new scale um, power module. Um, I think if you look at that one, they are talking about it coming um, to market at the end of um, this decade, mm. so late 2020s. Yep. I think for Australia, we wouldn't be looking at the late 2020s anyway um, because you do need to build up enough capacity mm. um, within your own country um, to manage this sort of source of energy. Yeah. Um, I, I, I would argue, though, that our our AUKUS deal um, that the Morrison government struck um, is going to lead to the need for far greater mm. development of our people, our processes, yep. our systems for nuclear management in Australia anyway. Yep. Um, and that provides a good platform if we were at a later date to make a decision as a country to go down the path of nuclear energy. The other thing we're doing is changing our transmission lines, which are all built on these large power stations, these large coal-fired power stations, and the, the sources of our power are being diffused across to wind farms and solar farms and some pumped hydro and the like. So that would seem to me to fit in with this, that if you've got these small things, they can then be part of that, that then tap into these new transmission lines? Look, I, I think that's right. And um, I mean, to, to some extent, um, um, there, there's a, uh, a, a plug and go um, proposition with small modular reactors, mm. because um, they would plug in very effectively with our existing system. Um, but we also know that there's going to be an enormous demand for additional capacity moving forward. Yep. As more renewables come in, yep. um, the question that we need to ask as a country is are we prepared to at least consider the possibility of small modular reactors? Yep. Labor says no, by the way. They're yeah. not even prepared to have the conversation, which is daft. Um, I've, never, I've never come across a, a, uh, a major political party in the liberal democratic world that says we will not speak about a particular technology because we don't want to. Because, um, because I, I know, and 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 look, there has 
they'll say, well, there has there has been a conversation, which is your inquiry, which produced a report and which has a lot of information about these things. And as you've said, and you've been clear about it, it's not something we can go and buy off the shelf today. We are talking later in the decade, but this is the kind of planning that we need to do with our energy system. So what you're saying is let's let's talk about these, let's find out a bit more about these and we can plan for them if we at least yeah, talk that's about right. it. That's right. I mean, and Labor's approach has, has been almost, well, we've had the conversation, see you later. However, that, that conversation we had, the inquiry that I had chaired, came up with some very clear recommendations. And, and one of those recommendations was, as a nation, we need a two-way dialogue on mm. this. Um, um, we've got to remember there's, there's a few prerequisites for this, for having nuclear energy in any country. Um, and the first of all, and the most important, is a social licence. People have to agree with yep. it. And you cannot get to that unless you have an open discussion sure. with the public, not a bunch of politicians in the bubble in Canberra. Um, yep, important, and I chaired it. I'd be a fool if I said otherwise. However, um, that in itself does not build a social licence. Um, you have to engage with the Australian public, and I think we shouldn't be shy in doing so. Well, that's why I wanted to have this conversation. We've spent a bit of time on it, but I think it's important because I think it's a really important conversation. People are going to be talking about the safety issues, which, again, is, is, is another debate that y you've looked at, uh, which has been talked about in the con context of these uh, these ones. And then there's the, the issue of the cost, whether they're cost-effective in terms of how much they cost to run and install compared to, say, a large solar plant. And then, of course, the fact is it's dispatchable uh, house all of those things you're saying we should be talking about and your your side of politics is now prepared to talk about it because you weren't you weren't prepared to embrace it in government were you well well uh, not so I mean I mean let's let's remember a couple of things here firstly it was uh, our government that not only ran the report on nuclear energy but uh, we had also added small modular reactors to our technology investment roadmap uh, for, for a post-2030 uh, world. So uh, we, we did that. Um, only last year, we signed a clean technology partnership with the UK, and that listed yep. cooperation on small modular reactors. Now, it'll be interesting to see if the new Albanese government wants to um, scrap all of that. Um, but we absolutely started um, taking action on this and um, and we believe the next step is an open dialogue with the Australian public. All right, we've spent a bit of time on it, but it's important. It's an issue. I'm always happy to talk about it. So let's, uh, Thanks, let's keep God. in touch and uh, maybe we can have this conversation because they, they do make, prima facie, they make a lot of sense, make a lot of sense. Yeah, and a lot of it will be busting myths, right? I yep. mean, you talked before about, you know, one last one from me. You talked before about the, the safety issues. MIT in the US put out a, a, a usual, they call it the mortality rate, um, and, you know, the safest of every energy source in the world, guess what it is? Nuclear. Yep. Okay, all right. I know Thanks you're a champion much, for it. That's what we'll keep in touch. Thank you so much for Good your time tonight. It. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye now.